It's Kate and Oliver Hudson. Hudson. <laughs> Host of the new podcast, Sibling, Sibling Revelry. Revelry. That's right. We started this show because, you know what? No one talks about siblings and that dynamic. The siblings, they know each other better than anybody. Yes. You know. Listen to Sibling Revelry on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Frances Fry. And I'm Ann Morris. And we are the hosts of a new TED podcast called Fixable. We've helped leaders at some of the world's most competitive companies solve all kinds of problems. On our show, we'll pull back the curtain and give you the type of honest, unfiltered advice we usually reserve for top executives. Give us a call and we'll help you solve the problems you're stuck on. Listen to Fixable on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Episode 210, Tips to Live Zero Waste Frugally. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast, where you'll learn to save money, save money embrace simplicity, embrace and live a richer life. Here are your hosts, Jen and Jill. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast. My name is Jen. My name is Jill. And today we are talking about zero waste living, why it's frugal, and how to do it maybe even more frugally than what you may see on the internet. This is a new topic for me in some regard. I'm aware that it exists. I've heard about zero waste, generally the extreme version where someone keeps all of their waste in a mason jar. And so I'm just like, oh, well, that's not realistic for me. So (laughs) I'm just going to ignore that movement. But seeing more and more how this actually can be woven into our frugal, minimalist, simple lifestyle and how it can benefit us, our finances, our environment, our relationships. And yeah, just being a whole lot more aware of my consumption and my waste. And I'm excited to have this conversation because it's definitely been on my mind a lot recently. Well, yeah. So we've been uh, in our financial freedom mentorship. April has been a zero waste challenge for us. Uh, We had an interview on Earth Day. So originally we wanted to do this episode on Earth Day, but we don't like change. So we didn't. Uh, so we're doing it a little a little late, but we have been reading Zero Waste Home and doing this Zero Waste Challenge, and it's something that I it's probably the challenge I've been most excited for because it is the one I had to learn and change the most for. So we're really excited to share what we've been learning with you, and um, like just kind of demystify what going zero waste has to be, especially the startup, because that is what gets most people is starting the zero waste lifestyle because it does have some startup costs, but not actually as many as you would think. So let's dive in, shall we, Jill? Let's do it. Yes. Uh, First, this episode is brought to you by Mexico. When this episode releases, I will be in Mexico hopefully sitting by a pool with a drink in my hand. Am I going with my family? No. Am I going with my husband? No. Am I going with Jill? I wish, but no. It's going to be me and my other lady friends, uh, the two other friends that I have besides Jill, and some other personal finance nerds, because it is actually a work uh, retreat that just happens to be in Mexico. And you know why I'm able to be in Mexico right now? Because I saved for it. And you can save for a trip to Mexico without your family, too, by starting a sinking fund, preferably in a high-yield savings account. We like Axos Bank for its 0.61% APY and no fees. So if you want to leave your family on vacation, open a sinking fund. If you open one at Axos at frugalfriendspodcast.com slash A-X-O-S, every account open supports the show at no cost to you. And if you're also a human being who enjoys being with their family and wants to travel, (laughs) it's still a good idea to save for your family vacations. Well, that's not to be what this episode's brought to you by. Okay, leaving all of us. This one's brought to you by Mexico 
without that's I sorry I I apologize to our sponsor it's Mexico without your family that's the real sponsor of the show <laughs> not Mexico with your family Mexico oh, without them I hope we don't lose any fans I think we'll gain them <laughs> <laughs> our frugal we'll friends right understand sometimes yeah. it's nice to be away from your children exactly So if you are interested in sustainability and its intersection with frugality, because we do believe that it is an integral part, not just being a good steward of your financial resources, but being a good steward of your natural resources, we do have some other episodes you can check out. Episode 48, Why uh, Frugal is the New Green. Episode 157, we go a little deeper into eco-friendly frugality. And then episode 173, everyone needs to cue this one up to play after this. We interviewed author Ron Gonan, who is a pioneer in the recycling world on the financial and environmental benefit of a circular economy. That was not one of our most popular episodes. It is one of my favorite episodes. And I just hope everyone will will go in and hit play next on episode 173. That's all I'm going to say about it. Yeah, which I think just goes to show that we as a collective society are not talking about this that much. And Mm -hmm. it also takes a lot for us to engage in something that we can't see the immediate benefit to ourselves on. It is much more easy to tackle the micro level than the macro level. But I think in this conversation, it's the pairing of the two, how the macro level can impact the micro level how we in our homes, as we aim at zero waste, can benefit us and also our larger society and context and environment. Absolutely. So let's get into our first article. And this is straight, really straight out of the book that we've been reading for book club um, in the membership. And if you want to check out the membership, You can check it out at frugalfriendspodcast.com slash FFM. Even after April, uh, you'll be able to get access to our zero waste challenge that we did. But so this five R's is from the book we were reading called Zero Waste Home. And we both we've both like really enjoyed that book. What have you thought, Jill? It's really excellent. I think like what you said, Jen, this has been probably the most challenging challenge that we have done yet in that I really had to shift a lot and be, it it raised a lot of curiosity, a lot of problem solving, a lot of shifting, whereas a lot of our other challenges are so fruitful, beneficial, helpful. I love them. This for me particularly raised some things that I'd never thought about before where, you know, a no spend challenge is like, great, there's going to be some challenging parts to it, but it didn't, didn't cause me to actually think about the way that I live so much as this challenge has. That's just me personally. So I, I really liked it because I think she answered a lot of questions, both in this article, as well as in her book for what to do with, you know, the various waste that we might encounter or how we consume and actually make this a realistic lifestyle and the benefits of it. Some of the benefits that I not didn't even think about previously. Mm -hmm. So yes, I really enjoyed it. So you could tell I'm excited to talk about it. Yes. So the website is unsustainablemagazine.com and the book is Zero Waste Home by Bea Johnson. So let's, you've heard of the three R's. Um, But she takes a little bit further with five R's. So let's get into the first R, which is refuse. Uh, So say no to what you don't need. And it's essentially she's saying, learn how to say no and mean it. And I think as if you are a people pleaser or somebody who loves free stuff, which should hit 100% of our listeners on either one of those, this is going to be a really hard one. (laughs) But it is, she says it's her favorite R because you have to be intentional with everything that comes into your home and intentional about the environmental impact of your actions. So I think this is one of those boundaries things where we have we have to frugality is almost a practice in creating boundaries between your uh, family, between your friends, 
and even the greater world at large. And that's what I really like about this one. This one was very challenging for me right off the bat. So, good yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. One of those things that she pointed out that I never really thought about is how many things people Full are trying to give us on a regular basis. Even in a daily, she gave a really simple daily life example of you wake up, you open your door, and there's a flyer for lawn service hanging on the door. So you pull that off. Then, you know, you go to the grocery store and someone's handing you a receipt. Then you go for food and people are handing you straws and takeout stuff that ends up in the trash. Mm-hmm. And and then you come home and your mailbox is full of junk mail. And there's just like, there's so much coming into our life on a daily basis. And this is the first step. And I like how she really describes that it does go in order. So Jen and I are volleying back and forth on what the five R's are, but you do have to start here with refusing and then moving into the rest of the four mm-hmm. R's. And, and then it's kind of like cyclical. But this refusing is really where it starts is the ability to say no. And of course, that can even include refusing things that people are wanting to give you that that we talk about this a lot refusing gifts refusing extra things which is uncomfortable but as we train ourselves we can get better at it one tip that bea gives in her book is just simple answers not needing to give a long dialogue explanation or feeling like you need to really defend yourself, but just practicing the simple things. She, one of her go-tos is, I don't have a trash can. I, I, yeah. I, like, I would be lying if I said that. She's not yeah. lying. Uh, but, you know, that was just like a simple thing. Or, you know, we're, we are really simple in our household. We don't have a place for this. Whatever it is, but just a simple explanation. So there's so much more to be said on that, but we're going to move on. To the second yeah. R, which is reduce. And this is partially that learning to let go. Once we've refused, we also then want to move into reducing uh, how much we have, how much uh, yeah, we, we take in is both in that reduction process. This one's quite interesting to me because this is a clearing out. Like to me, this is a wasting. But I think with this R, we're being really specific about if there's things we don't want in our home, we're not simply sending them to the landfill. We're going to find another home for them. So this is if you've got extra things in your pantry or your closet or your toy bin that you're not utilizing, we are giving it away. So I see this reduce as part pairing with minimalism, where Mm -hmm. we kind of go through this process, what don't we need? But then I think the idea with reduction is we then don't bring in more. So it's almost like there's this big process that we go through, but then after that, we learn what we what we actually need, what we actually utilize, so we're not bringing in more. So it makes the refusal even easier as we move forward. Yeah. And I think this right here is like frugality in a nutshell. Like this one R, like reduce your consumption, reduce your spending. Don't eliminate. We're not, we're not eliminating. We're reducing down to what's best for us, what's best for the environment and finding the balance within that. And, and so I, this has always been my true north when figuring out what's frugal and what's not is like not what can I get the best deal on? Do I get it for free? Like stuff like that. But is it a is it a reduction of everything? All of the clutter and the noise that the world continuously brings into my life, does it somehow reduce that? Like and I know that's kind of like bigger picture than just zero waste, but I just have always been obsessed with like the three R's. And so to find out that the book <laughs> was like kind of based around five R's, I was like, okay, I didn't know this when I started reading. But yeah, so I I really believe that, and we've said it before, you can't buy your way to greed. And so the first one is super challenging. Like 
like refusing things that are free, I have a hard time with. And I'm I'm definitely going to give this episode to Travis because he has an even harder time with that. But this one I love and embrace so wholeheartedly. But yeah, so like this one is, uh, I have nothing more to say. This is great. But it also says like the life you had before you were refusing, all the things you accumulated, those are things you're going to have to reduce. So like all of the tiny little shampoo uh, and body wash bottles that you get from the hotels or the Airbnbs, those have to go. And uh, I have I have quite a few of them. But use them first. That's uh, see, that's where I like the zero waste like is kind of hard for me because and the and the minimalism too. like I have a junk drawer because I'm not just going to get rid of things that I will use. Like I know I will use body wash and shampoo. I just haven't yet. So that's why there's this like, it, it's not either or. It's just finding the synergy of all of it. Well, there is a tough tension because I think that some zero wasters, if I can put a title to it, <laughs> some zero wasters will go the direction of just keeping everything to keep it out of a landfill. That can be a picture in our mind of people who go zero waste. That one end of the spectrum is we utilize everything. If it's a paper plate, we're not throwing it away. We're going to somehow figure out how to wash and dry that paper plate and keep using it. And we're going to have containers everywhere, cluttering everything. And so I think what what we're advocating for and what this article is advocating for is the pairing of zero waste with a minimalist lifestyle. So you have less, you're bringing less into the home. You're not just maintaining your lifestyle and yet not throwing anything away because that that's what moves towards hoarding. And that's not a lifestyle that we want to advocate for just for mental and emotional and physical health. Mm-hmm. So there is, but there is a tension there because as you begin this, there is going to be a, certainly a startup cost and a waste startup, if that's a word. Like there is going to be a lot that you're getting rid of in this process. But then the hope is that that's not the lifestyle that you keep living of bringing in a ton of stuff that just needs to find its way to the landfill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's move on from refuse and reduce to reuse. And this is maybe the one that I have the second hardest time with. I do love reusable water bottles, reusable cloth napkins. There are some things that I do use a lot of reusables. And then there's just some that I like I am not the person that has the the cabinets full of old glass jars from foods. And and that's kind of the minimalist in me cuz I have what I have and I just I will recycle the rest. But so I was challenged in that instead of just getting single use plastic to get more things that come in glass because glass is much easier to recycle than plastics because not all plastics are recyclable. I keep learning that. Like and not eat one plastic that's recyclable here isn't recyclable there, but the glass is. And so that was one thing with the reuse that I have been inspired to to do. But there are a few other things. So like she gives some examples So paper tissues can be replaced with handkerchiefs. You can get straight edge razors instead of disposable razors, cotton cloths instead of dish sponges, loose tea instead of tea bags. Um, I actually did not buy coffee filters for my coffee maker. I just reused a reusable. It already had a reusable filter in there. I just kept a filter on it (laughs) because I liked I didn't like the residue at the bottom. And then I was like, Jen, you're a grown up. Get over it. So (laughs) there have been some things that I've been challenged to like do more of. And I think that's that's great. We do things in steps and stages and we continually take in knowledge and surround ourselves with people that challenge us to just be a little bit better every year. Yeah, I love this list. This list is an excellent place to start. And there's so many things that I see on here that I can shift in my own lifestyle. What's one thing that you're going to shift? Okay, that I will shift? 
Yeah. I'm putting you on the spot, Jill. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm looking at it. So uh, the the paper and plastic bags, I definitely bring my own bags to like Aldi or Trader Joe's because they force you to do that. But let's say I shop I at that. Walmart or anywhere else. I don't. And I just didn't ever think about it. Like I think, oh, well, they have bags, but here's a store that they don't have bags. So done. Now Anytime mm-hmm. I go into any store, I have my reusable bags in my car. Like they're already there for those other grocery stores. I'm going to start utilizing that. Now, here's my one barrier because we're going on a side tangent now, apparently, is that I will use those bags, the plastic ones from Walmart or Home Depot for trash bags in my bathroom. But then that's what brings up that whole other issue of what if I stop n- making as much trash? But I think like it's not real. I'm I'm going to make trash. I'm not. I know that I'm not going to be the person who ends up with their annual trash in a mason mason jar. But then I would have to figure out an alternative trash bag for my bathroom. Well, I think also there's always going to be people trying to get rid of their plastic bags. So if yeah. you are ever in a pinch where you need plastic bags, like grocery bags for your bathroom, you can just go on the buy nothing group and say. I'll take these off your hands. Or you go to the grocery store and they have recycling bins for those bags because they're not recyclable in regular recycling bins. And you just stick your hand in there and pull some out. I'm at least reusing it, giving the Mm -hmm. life of the thing a little bit longer, more uses, which I think is also a part of that reuse. Sometimes it does end up getting thrown out, but how much more life can we get out of any kind of product also helps. Yeah. And and you, Jill, you're the one that like taught me about like always think of the third option. There's always a third mm. option. There's the yes and the no. And those are usually very obvious. But if you sit down and just think about it a little bit longer, there's always a third option. And sometimes there's, you know, four or eight options, but you just have to think about it a little long. And that's the same with what we say about frugality. It's not inconvenient. It's not, it's just not the most convenient. You just think about, sit down, think about it for a few minutes or a few days and, and see, find what the third option is. I think that is what's so challenging about this, but I like it. I enjoy the creativity, the problem solving, the curiosity that this challenge has created of, okay, I could do this. Then what? what's the ripple effect of that? How can I solve for that? What might else need to change and shift? Where could I make more shifts? And it just, it's been this like really rich challenge. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get to the fourth R. The fourth R is recycle. And we only get to the fourth R once we've made it through the other three. So recycling is for the things that we can't refuse, reduce, or reuse. And I love how Bea highlights this. Uh, she shares how often she people are aware of her zero waste lifestyle and they're like, oh yeah, me too. I recycle everything. <laughs> and she's like, that's totally not it. I mean, like she's excited for them <laughs> with like where they're at in their process and journey, but we don't want to stop there. It's not just, oh great, we recycle because there's so much to be said about the recycling industry and how much has not been solved for, how unaware we are as a society of how to recycle well. There's a lack of or like businesses, corporations, companies who are utilizing recycled material. There's a lack of consumers buying recycled material. Like once it has been recycled into something new, we have a problem with not actually purchasing those recycled items. We're still buying the single use items. So there's, there, it, it's not as if we can just put our recycling out by the road and be like, pat ourselves on the back, done deal. I did my due diligence. No, there's so much more that goes into it, which is really disheartening for me because I was in that <laughs> camp of, yeah, I recycle. I'm like, I'm doing such a good thing. And then there's this whole myth around recycling. So we only do this once we've exhausted the first three R's. 
And and then we need to do our due diligence in doing it well. well. What can be recycled? Make sure our recyclables are cleaned out, making sure that we're not recycling a ton of stuff because, again, we don't have a system that can actually support the way that we're doing recycling right now. Yeah. And if you are not recycling and this is where you need to start, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. You know, whatever you have in your refrigerator right now that you can recycle when you're done using it, start with that. And then start to refuse and reduce and reuse. Whatever you can start with today is good enough. But yeah, there are so many people that just sit on that and be like, oh, I did the one thing. I did I did eco-sustainability. And it's really... Recycling is much more confusing. It's It actually makes me angry every time I go to recycle something because I'm like, I either have to do a lot to get it to be recyclable or I just don't. And I I just put it and I'm like, I don't really know. And then I end up I don't want to contaminate the recycling. So I throw it away like uncertainty is a common experience for me when I recycle. Like anytime I go to my recycling bin, I it is paired with a feeling of uncertainty. And that's not the greatest (laughs) Right. Which is why I think reducing is, again, the key. Like reduce what you buy and you reduce what you recycle. And if you can rethink, like when I'm now purchasing instead of my next move is like, so I've I switched to like mayonnaise only in glass jars. And so now I'm just going to move my condiments. Like when I rebuy, I'm going to try to do everything in glass because I know glass, like clear glass, definitely recyclable. And just things that I don't have to be so confused about. Like but the that's paper around the glass might not be. I think true recycling is you have to pull it off. You've got to clean it really well, get the glue yeah. as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Which I I can do that enough. But but yeah. So recycling is not what we want to rest on. It's definitely the reducing and reusing as much as possible. And that takes us to our last R, which I actually, I like and Jill very much likes, but it's rot. And that is compost. Rot it. Yeah. So Jill actually likes it because she does use the compost. I, it just makes me feel better about not wasting. I don't do anything with the compost. But it is a way to use your food scraps. And I actually learned you can use a lot more in compost, depending on the type of compost you have. You can use a lot more, put a lot more in there than I thought you could. Yes. Um, Dryer lint. Very forgiving. Yeah. Dryer lint. Dust. Cardboard. Dust mites. Yeah. I had no idea. She's even putting like. Food like like animal waste. I guess she has like a special compost. I don't know if it's special, but yeah, she is not a vegan by any means. Like, so she puts her animal waste, um, not her animal like pet waste, right? Not that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She said like even there is like and- a type you could. Yeah. So it's it's vast. Yeah. Yeah. I've got to learn more about that. For me, I've got to, but I, because I know that if you put animal waste into like food scraps into your compost, that's when you can get pests. So there's definitely is a way to go about that in a, in a way where you wouldn't have rats around your garden. That's not my yeah. goal. And if you are not a gardener, if you have a black thumb, then you can create compost and maybe trade it with other people who do have it for their fresh veggies that they have, like when stuff, whatever's in season that are, they're trying to get rid of. So that's an option if you do not uh, want to grow your own food. Um, that can be a way to kind of use the compost and still get some of the benefits of people who do know how to garden and grow things. Yeah. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. 
Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash strategic. That's oracle.com slash strategic. oracle.com slash strategic. Shopify helps you sell at every stage of your business. Like that, let's put it online and see what happens stage. And the site is live. That we opened a store and need a fast checkout stage. Thanks. You're all set. That count it up and ship it around the globe stage. This one's going to Thailand. And that, wait, did we just hit a million orders stage? Whatever your stage, businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 a month trial at shopify.com slash listen. That's a great list. We encourage you to try it. But we also want to move into talking about how we can pair frugal tips with zero waste. So we are talking about frugal zero waste. So this next article we're getting into is seven easy frugal tips that are also sustainable. So this is from rainbowveganrock.com. I very much I very much like that URL. <laughs> Rainbow Vegans Rock. Here we go. Mm-hmm. So the first tip on here is to buy secondhand. And you all know this. This list, mm. if you've been listening to Frugal Friends for a long time, nothing on this list is going to be new to you. But we're looking at it from the perspective of sustainability and zero waste, or at least reducing waste. I mean, even Bea in her book describes that zero waste is nearly impossible in the culture that we live in. But we're aiming at it. It's something to aim at. And so when we buy secondhand, this continues to keep things out of the landfill. It allows us to reuse and almost kind of recycle or upcycle things. Of course, we still want to be aiming at reduction in this process. We don't want to go buy secondhand just because it's a deal and be bringing more things into our house that we may not need and might find its way to the trash can quicker. But when we do need something, this is the first place we should be going to, whether it's an actual physical thrift store or it's Craigslist, or Facebook Marketplace, or eBay. These are the spots that we should be going to to find the items that we need, again, to take from somebody else who's not going to be using it anymore, to put that thing to use, to keep them from throwing it away. And this is also a solution for us, not just in buying secondhand, but when we don't need something anymore. These are the places we should be going to, to be donating or selling. Yeah. And we went thrifting this weekend, Jill. We did. We got some. Yeah. I was looking for things for our frugal friends party. Didn't find what I needed, but I did find. <laughs> Actually, I found this shirt. I needed more. Oh, I found this shirt. I needed another. <laughs> Look at us. We're so excited to wear our new shirts. Yeah. <laughs> I realized I don't have any like professional short sleeve shirts. I always, it's either like a dress that I wear or a lightweight long sleeve or sleeveless, but I only have one other short sleeve shirt. So I got a second one. So now I have two professional short sleeve shirts. So you're either going to see this or my black one. Love that. Uh, Yeah. And so I don't particularly love thrifting. Like I, we went to one thrift store and afterwards I was like exhausted. So typically I do most of my thrifting online. Um, we use ThreadUp. We have a promo code for $10 off ThreadUp at frugalfriendspodcast.com slash ThreadUp, no A. And then Poshmark, eBay. I love eBay. Their prices are usually cheaper than Poshmark, and it's the same exact things. They post them in both places. And then this one also says Depop um, or Facebook Marketplace. So there are plenty of places to get secondhand that are not a thrift store, too. The second one on this list is bulk buying. 
Uh, and so when Jill and I were originally talking about this, she thought I meant like Sam's Club Costco bulk buying. And then I I was like, I want glass containers for bulk buying. And she didn't know what I was talking about. But this is like at your health food store where you're filling up your own container of shelf stable like products. Um, and so that's something that I'm going to try and move towards and trying to bring instead of using the plastic bags they give, trying to bring my own glass containers that are uniform in size. I, I'm just not here for bringing seven different types of jars and getting them all teared and then going to fill them up. I'm here for for simplicity. So I might just start with one, maybe brown rice. I think I'm due for a brown rice uh, refill. So, but yeah, I am, I've, I'm very interested to try this and see the price difference. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Yes, there, as with some other things like minimalism, eco friendly, sustainability, zero waste, there is a version of this that could go not super frugal. We can, in anything, Mm -hmm. spend a ton of money. Although, if it's within our values and something we really want to aim at, then it can be frugal living. But again, that intentionality with our finances, with our lifestyle. So I think we all have to find what is what's going to work for us because going to seven different stores, spending all of the time and energy to make your own laundry detergent, butter, mend clothes, like to do all of the things as if we were living in 1522 might not work for everybody. So there is Mm -hmm. definitely a lot of room in here to figure out what, how does this pair with your version of frugality? And like you said, Jen, just being doing a little bit better each day towards the goals that we have stated. I will say this article does highlight bulk buying in your large, what is it? The the big box stores like your Costco or your Sam's Club. Now we've also still better. We've all, yes, I, I guess it reduces waste in the sense that you're not throwing out five tiny bottles, you're throwing out Mm -hmm. one slightly larger bottle and you're probably reducing the waste. I don't know. I would guess by 20 to 30 percent. That's I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not great at (laughs) numbers, but that'd be my (laughs) guess. But then you've also got the alternative where sometimes that isn't minimal and we may not, it might not be financially sustainable for us to be spending a ton of money on these like larger bulk items. So that's one of those that can kind of go either way. And we'd have to determine what will we buy bulk? How will we buy bulk? Is it worth it to us to be going to all these different stores to do this? So yeah, there's the bulk buying is one that I'm, I'm curious about. I'm a little bit on mm-hmm. the fence with. Because, yeah, it does reduce the cost per ounce, but you have to be selective. So instead of getting everything bulk, you choose maybe three things. We choose three things that we buy in bulk. We go to one store. We go to the store that has all of them. Or we choose the store that's closest to them and whatever store, whatever they have, that's what dictates our bulk. Because driving around all over also has an environmental impact. And it has a time impact. And we're not about that either. So sometimes you do have to let your location and what's available to you dictate what you keep in bulk. And don't get you don't need to get everything in bulk. So like I'm just going to start with brown rice because I use brown rice every week. And I love that Bea said that she keeps a jar on a rotation of like unique like grains or whatever she wants to try. So she doesn't have like 20 containers with all these different bulk things, which can be expensive. She has her set and then she has one jar or one container that if there's something interesting that she wants to try, she'll fill it up and she has to use all of that before she can get something else that she wants to try. So I actually love that too. Yes. 
Agreed. All right. This next one, which I am all for, where we compare frugality with zero waste, is mending our things. So if something is broken or torn or ripped, we look at mending and fixing. Mending to me kind of seems very fabric clothing specific. I would take it a step further and just say fixing things. If something gets broken, rather than throwing it away, tossing it to the side, putting it in a junk drawer, how can we make this thing useful again, work again, serve its purpose again? And picking up a new skill set in this regard. I don't think we have to all become seamstresses, but if there's a hole in our clothing, is there? could we mend it before we go out and buy new and just throw it away? So I'm, I'm all about sewing on buttons, patching up our clothes, fixing the things that are broken, which is going to also mean that we buy quality things that's worth fixing, that's going to last mm-hmm. us a long time. That's a whole other part of this when we do buy yeah. that it's quality. And then we make sure we're going to use it. can be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. And and some things are created to not be able to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're just created cheaply. So that is something we also have to be intentional about buying. Like the new triple The author. Sorry. Yeah. The author of this article... Did you hear my story about my Nutribullet? Is that what you were bringing up, Jill? Uh, everyone has a story about a Nutribullet not working I, and throwing it out and getting yeah. a new one. I went through two or three. I've got other friends who... Oh, my I gosh. Hope Nutri- well, Nutribullet will never sponsor us because I think that they make crap products. At least yeah. the one. Oh, the bullet. I'm the so Nutribullet. I'm not the only the, one. The rubber, uh, like melts yes, that away was that was my- and it yes. smells and there's no... Like, how are oh you going to fix the rubber that melts away? You can't. I tried. Yep. Wow. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Listen, if you work for Nutribullet, okay, <laughs> just let them know. Um, but this author of this article talks about uh, trying to return a dehumidifier that didn't work and to the manufacturer. Instead, uh, and her husband was like, did you like, are you returning that to be fixed? And she didn't even realize that that's what she would be doing. She just thought she was going to get a new dehumidifier. And she's like, well, I could try I could just try to repair it myself. Um, and I don't necessarily try and ne- recommend trying to repair something that might be like defunct or just a lemon, but definitely anything that maybe could use it, do a repair. Just try and YouTube it. I We had a listener who just, she was listening to us and then she said that her oven went out or something. And she's like, you know what? I'm just going to try. I'm just going to watch YouTube or maybe it was her husband or something. I don't remember, but they, they watched YouTube and it ended up being like a fifteen thirty dollar fix. Wow. Like yeah. to fix. And, and it's not something like if you realize that it's, you're in over your head, once you watch the YouTube video, go get it fixed. Yeah. But if you don't try, you'll never know if it's the easy fix or the hard fix. Yeah. I will say we've also gotten really great deals on things that we've been willing to fix that other people are getting rid of. So for instance, Mm -hmm. we've been wanting this really high-end in-wall microwave oven combination for the kitchen that we're renovating at our house. It's very expensive. It's like four to $5,000 new. And we're like, we're never doing that. Well, one popped up on Facebook Marketplace broken for a fraction of that cost. And we snagged it and Eric is fixing it. And we're going to have like, we're going to keep that out of the landfill because the manufacturer eventually told this person, like, we're just replacing it. So do what you want with it. Like, meaning just like, go ahead and throw it out, this massive uh, appliance. And so them, good on them that they decided not to just throw it away and find a new home for it. And then if you do have some of those problem solving (laughs) ability to fix things, now we're be, we'll be able to give it a new life. We got a great deal, and it's going to make our kitchen look amazing. So win, 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 when you mend and fix. <laughs> yeah. And or if you're not handy like that and you have a friend that is, you can see if they will like do it for money. Some people like to just toy around with those things or be helpful mm-hmm. and be like, hey, like I have this. If I got this for free or, or whatever, would you fix it? I'll pay you. And that could be a thing too. Mm-hmm. So, all, so many options. 
There's always a third option. So many. Yes. The next one is probably one of our favorites, if not our ultimate favorite. It is mindful purchases. Uh, And that's kind of what we're all about. Intentional spending, conscious consumerism, mindful purchases, whatever you want to call it. But realizing what your values are and then making sure your all of your spending, not just your discretionary, but like your your mandatory, quote unquote, spending as well, is aligned with those values. And I think the hardest part in that equation isn't making the mindful purchases. It's actually figuring out what your core values are, because we are our core values are so often influenced by media, friends, family, coworkers, jobs, whatever. It's very hard to figure out what do I actually want to have in my life? What do I want to live in? What do I want to acquire, have, not have? It's hard to figure that out. And that's what you need to do in order to be able to make mindful purchases. And that on the flip side with also being aware of the impact behind the the things you are consuming. So the journey that it took to get wherever you are. So this is some, I mean, we're... Mindful purchases is not just a tip (laughs) on some article. It is the foundation of frugality. I think that's, that is when someone asks us to define frugality, it is some version of mindful spending Mm -hmm. than being intentional with your resources. That's it. So done. Yeah, if my mic was not on a stand, I'd drop it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you could you could throw it on the ground if you want, just to prove your point. No, I love I love my mic. I'll just leave it here. So the article also mentions as a tip in this space free activities. It might seem at first like it doesn't fit, but as we engage in free activities, generally we're not engaging in purchasing things, collecting things, gathering things. And so there can be a pairing of engaging in fun, free things that mean zero waste. So when we enjoy time on the weekend with friends, with family, in things that are free, and we also are able to implement the refuse, reduce, reuse mentality then this is a a helpful kind of frugal, zero-waste pairing. Mm -hmm. And the last one on this list, reusing containers. So definitely if you want to do this, get your glass jars or look at your thrift stores. I am still in the market for some more glass containers that look aesthetically pleasing. I have open shelving and I care about that stuff. So, But uh, there are some pretty good looking glass containers that food comes in. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And if you have any suggestions, DM us on Instagram and let us know what we should be, what food we should be consuming to get those cool glass jars. Yeah, that or, yeah, finding them secondhand. Definitely will not be buying them used. And I like the tips that they give for how we can reuse some containers. One of my go tos for glass jars is to keep hold on to some of them again um, this is where it bumps up against my minimalism i don't want to have an entire cabinet dedicated to glass jar empty glass jars but if i give flowers as a gift to somebody or sometimes i'll make like an antipasta or an appetizer of some sort and it's an easy way to give it to people and not require them to be giving back the container. So I'll kind of keep some things around so that I can gift things to people and not have to purchase containers for it or be putting the pressure on them to get my container back to me. Absolutely. But you know what? There's never any pressure to give back to the people. <laughs> and al- always always, always does give. Never never hardly receives. This is zero waste for sure. The, the bill, bill of, of the, the week. week. That's right. It's time for the best minute of your entire week. 
Maybe a baby was born and his name is William. Maybe you paid off your mortgage. Maybe your car died and you're happy to not have to pay that bill anymore. Duck bills, Buffalo bills, Bill Clinton. This is the Bill of the Week. Hi, Jen and Jill. My name is Amy. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And my Bill of the Week is my dad, William, but known to everyone else as Bill. My dad was a minimalistic, frugal, simple living, non-materialistic person before it was cool. He's content with living a simple life. And so when my brothers and I try to pick his brain for potential birthday or Christmas gifts, his response is usually, I could use a new fish filter for his aquarium and they cost like $10. So I just want to say cheers to my dad who keeps things simple, but frustrates those of us who want to buy him presents because he does not care for material things. Thanks, ladies. Keep up the good work. Love the show. Oh, Amy Marie, I am I am in love with your dad, Bill. He sounds like the best. Bill sounds so great. Bill, thank you for paving the way for your family Mm. in this minimalism, contentment, simple living that doesn't require much, but you also just sound like an amazing person with rich relationship with those around you, which I think is what this can lead to. Like it can be a byproduct. This minimalism, simple living can lead to contentment, which leads to yeah, it can better relationships with people and just time enjoyed together. And how amazing, Amy, to hear how much you enjoy and admire your dad in this. Well done. And thanks, Bill. What a great Bill. If you want to submit your Bill of the Week, visit frugalfriendspodcast.com slash Bill to leave us your dad Bill, your duck Bill, your man Bill, any Bill. Discover the heartwarming and hilarious world of sibling connections on Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson. You might be asking yourself, what is Sibling Revelry? Yeah, well, we just made it up. They'll have some laughs and maybe inspire some people along the way with universal tales of what it's like to grow up with brothers and sisters. We're full blood siblings, the only full blood sibling. In our family. Well, not in the world. I mean, no, in the whole world. That's just it. Like, no one. (laughs) Dive into family tales and explore the human mind with guests like Joel and Benji Madden. And it's fun because we've decided to open it up, you know, to really like all kinds of different siblings. And it's going to be an awesome season. It's more than a podcast, it's a celebration of the ties that bind us. Listen to Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. From the studio who brought you the number one podcast, The Piketon Massacre, this is Murder 101. A group of high school students started a project to research a string of unsolved murders. Those murders happened in the mid-1980s. He's out there doing stuff. He just didn't stop. Everything that the students predicted through their profile turned out to be accurate. Redhead killer profile. Male, Caucasian, 5'9 to 6'2, 180 to 270 pounds. Unstable home, absent father and a domineering mother. Right handed, IQ above 100, most likely heterosexual. There is no profile of this killer except for the ones the students created. Just because some of these women no longer have people to speak for them does not mean that they deserve to not be spoken for. What if this guy's still alive? Like, what if he comes after us? I said, Are you going to kill me? And he said, Yes. Listen to Murder 101 on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And now it's time for The Lightning Round. The Lightning Round. This is, uh, this is the part of the show where our podcast manager, Goldie, asks us a question to get us vulnerable. I no longer make up the <sighs> questions because um, Jill feels attacked <laughs> when I... <laughs> like, you know too much. Typically for... Yeah. <laughs> so now Goldie does it. And now it's fun because I don't see the question until right before it comes. So this week's question... What are your compromise items? So like not zero waste, but still eco-friendly. 
go for it, Jen. Jill. What is it? <laughs> yeah, you you kind of took mine. Um <laughs> so can you go first okay. so that I can think of another one? Um, I I don't know if this is ego friendly, but toilet paper. I I can't give that up. Uh, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. my that's my no compromise yep. item. I don't know that there's ever gonna be a time when I say no to toilet paper. Mm. Mm-hmm. However, well, hold on. As I'm thinking out loud and that problem solving creative juices are flowing. What's the third way, Jill? The third way <laughs> is a bidet. Oh, and it rhymes too. The third <laughs> way is the bidet. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a big transition. People I, who I have them love them. Way. Those. Oh, I'm sure they do. Who have a bidet love their third way. <laughs> <laughs> It. I, I am squirming thinking about it. <laughs> I. Ooh. What is my compromise? Yeah. No. I'll never give up toilet paper. Okay. So here. Okay. So this isn't zero waste, I guess. But I actually, I like. I have to have a certain hair care product, like shampoo and conditioner. I have heard all of the ideas and the shampoo bars, and the. All of the apple cider vinegar. I've heard all of the ideas, but if you had my hair, which is very curly and very thin, you would know that I am fighting a battle, and I I can't I can't go zero waste. If I had your hair, hair. I think I'd be ten percent happier. I mean, but you know what? The gift to me is that I get to look at it. Yeah, and. (laughs) And my son has the same hair and everyone's always <sighs> trying to touch it and complimenting it. And I feel complimented by proxy because nobody does that to me. Such a cute adult. But yeah. But so I think the I do always recycle the um, plastic containers that they come in. And I think next time I will see if I can buy a larger size than what I currently have. I think those are my alternate. And, okay, so also I only shampoo my hair once a week. There you go. All the other times I will condition it. And I only condition it maybe like two or three times a week. All the other times I just like wet it because I do work out most mornings and sometimes I'll just either not wash it or just wet it. So that's a zero waste thing that I do. But I got to have, I got to have the right hair care. Mm -hmm. Oh, and rest assured, this is not the only area where where our lives need improvement. There's so <laughs> many other shifts and changes we can be making. But I think, mm-hmm. like we said at the beginning, we'll say at the end, it is about making small adjustments as we go and as we can see the low-hanging fruit of what needs to shift. Like, I got stressed yesterday about the junk mail that's coming. It's like, well, this shouldn't be my first step if I'm also still using paper towels. I shouldn't be hunting down Mm -hmm. and spending a ton of time making sure the local Catholic church doesn't send me like flyers all the time. It should be, what am I doing in my own personal life currently? Yeah. That, That could be a drastic shift, more drastic than the flyers that come to my door. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode, I hope you got some helpful tips that might help you conserve and steward wisely your natural resources. Thank you for your kind reviews. Like this one, it comes from Brittany7991. It says, real discussions happens to be five stars. She says, I'm so mad. I just found this podcast a few days ago. Wish I would have found it sooner. (laughs) I thought I was the only person who obsesses with money every day, all day, every purchase, every bill. This episode, Paying Off Debt and Mental Health with Melanie is amazing. She's so vulnerable and shared her anxiety related around money, OCD, anxiety, and I felt all her thoughts. I appreciate this podcast very much. Thank you, Brittany. Brittany, I love the aggressive way that you are giving us five stars. It's really beautiful. You are a kindred spirit. It resonates with with me. Kindred soul. I'm mad with Mm -hmm. you that you just found this (laughs) podcast. (laughs) 
<laughs> we also want to thank our friends who share these episodes on social media. So when you share the latest episode on Instagram, we're adding you. I'm <laughs> not kidding. We are adding you to our monthly drawing. So for every five tags and reviews we get each month, we do then give away $50 for you to spend in the Frugal Friends shop. So please keep leaving us reviews uh, wherever you listen to podcasts and sending the screenshots to reviews at frugalfriendspodcast.com. And don't forget to tag us on social. See you next week. Frugal Friends is produced by Eric Siriani. Okay, Jen. Zero Jill. waste is blowing my mind and it's it's invading my life. And it's probably it's a good thing. Life. It is. Yeah. yeah. And I think I had said this a while ago when I lived in a tiny home. It got me so much more connected to my consumption, my waste. I loved that. I did learn a lot through that. And I still have so much to learn. And I don't know if the main thing that's drawing me to this movement is just the challenge of it and the creative problem solving. Like, I do care, but I I yeah. honestly think that, like, <laughs> the challenging portion is, like, the majority of what is, like, magnetizing me to it. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot for a lot of people. Here's the thing that I am realizing I think to embrace this lifestyle more, I think it's going to cause me to be 10% less clean. Explain. I like I like I came to that conclusion yesterday. It might not be like a final conclusion. Well, so I've admitted this before and it still is a problem. I do have paper towels in my home and I do use the paper towels. Because I feel like it keeps my hands cleaner, I'm able to get a better clean on some of the things in my kitchen and my bathroom and then get rid of it versus if I'm like cleaning things and I'm using a reusable rag, that either means that I like once I use the rag on something that I perceive to be like dirty, it has to immediately go into the washer. That's not super sustainable. Or, like, I have to be okay with it just kind of being more dirty. Just, you know, like, okay, so for instance, you were over the other day, and I've got one of those, like, sink clean-out things in my kitchen sink, and it does collect some debris. I try and scrape off as much as possible, but there's still, like, some food scraps and stuff. And I'm the type of person who will use, like, a quarter of a paper towel to, like, clean – to scrape out what's in there into the trash can because it's not always just that. like the mm-hmm. great scra- it's not just like the food scraps it's also some of the like scum that can start to build up mm-hmm. and so okay in the past two days since you've been over I'm like all right what if I were to try life without doing that and so I'm just doing it with my hands I'm just like scraping it out with my hands and it just feels dirtier it feels like a more gross process I can get okay with it but it's just I, I think that's my realization. Like life just has to be n- my standards for cleanliness need to like decrease by 10 percent in order for me to engage in this lifestyle. Yes. What if you used an old toothbrush? We keep an old toothbrush at our sink because sometimes if you don't want to use your nails. OK. It just gets into those crevices. Yeah. OK. Um, and that is a. It's a small, yeah, yeah, it's a small thing. I do have a um, an old toothbrush under the sink for cleaning. That's good. That's good. This is a good, yeah. this is, we're brainstorming. This is good. I'm glad we're finding your third way. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> well, there but we then go. also, then I, then, and then I used a rag. I'm like, all right, we're pulling out the rag. The other thing about rags is they're often too thick. So, like, I yeah. also like paper towels for how thin they are and how I can get into crevices easier with how thin it is. I know you're probably going to say use a T-shirt, but I don't – the material of a T-shirt <laughs> – what I was going to say, actually. Okay. That's too thin. So there are these new um, – they dry, like, hard almost, and when you get them wet – 
they are <gasps> okay, um, yes. malleable like a paper towel. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you just rinse them off and dry them. And I forget what they're called, but they are like a paper towel like when wet. Okay. And then maybe so, I could have, because what I also found was, all right, because I was using a rag, I wiped down the counters and I'm like, oh, there's a spot on the floor I want to get up. So then I use it on the floor. But now I'm like, well, I'm, I can't use the rag that I just used on the floor back on the countertop. So now it's ready for the wash. But the third way could be that I have one for my countertops and like, you know, my more clean spaces and one for my more dirty stuff, like wiping the lid of the trash can or the floor. Boom. Jen, mm-hmm. look at this. Ugh. And and these reusable like paper towel things can just be rinsed off maybe with a little bit of soap and then dried and it's ready That's to go true. again. So you've just washed it like a dish. Soap but is supposed to clean things. So it's like I hand washed it once I... Theoretically, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I feel energized. I'm going to go not throw things away. That consultation is free. (laughs) Bye. Discover the heartwarming and hilarious world of sibling connections on Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson. Dive into family tales, explore the human mind, and laugh with guests like Joel and Benji Madden. It's more than a podcast. It's a celebration of the ties that bind us. And it's fun because we've decided to open it up to really like all kinds of different siblings and it's going to be an awesome season listen to sibling revelry with kate hudson and oliver hudson on the iHeartRadio app apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts i'm jacob goldstein i used to host planet money now i'm starting a new show it's called what's your problem every week on what's your problem entrepreneurs and engineers describe the future they're going to build once they solve a few problems I'm talking to people trying to figure out how to do things that no one on the planet knows how to do, from creating a drone delivery business to building a car that can truly drive itself. Listen to What's Your Problem on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts.